Welcome to Financial Repression Authority's Roundtable Insight, where the best fund managers, economists, and industry leaders discuss the key investment issues and challenges in the current macroeconomic environment. Hi, welcome to FRA's Roundtable Insight. This is host Richard Benulli. Today is Thursday, February 15th. We have today a great participant guest list here in the form of Chris Whalen, Peter Bookfar, and Ira Harris. Chris is an investment banker, author, and chairman of Whalen Global Advisors, LLC, which focuses on financial services, mortgage finance, and technology sectors. He was co-founder and principal of Institutional Risk Analytics from 2003 to 2013. Peter is the chief investment officer for the Bleakley Financial Group and Advisory, and he has a new Substack platform uh, leveraging from his book, report.com service. It offers great macroeconomic insight and perspective with lots of updates on economic indicators. And Ira's independent trader, hedge fund manager, global macro consultant, trading foreign currencies, equities, bonds, and commodities for over 40 years. He was also CME director from 1997 to 2003 and a stint also most recently. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Richard. You. Great. I thought we uh, begin with a global macro view on the economy and the financial markets. What, what are your thoughts, Chris? Uh, well, the global financial markets are uh, yet another proliferation of bubbles. I just kicked out my NVIDIA, my final piece of NVIDIA, after rioting hundreds of percent. So if that's a good inflation indicator, then I don't think we need to say anymore. <laughs> um, the consumer sector is still pretty quiet as of the end of the year. You're starting to see people put aside credit reserves for consumer, but not much. We're just barely above pre-COVID levels of default, credit cards, auto, you know, other than the bottom quarter, the very people who got kicked around by COVID. Uh, the rest of the stack is okay. And equities, like, you know, like I say, it's it's uh, every day is a new day. You know, New York Community Bank, for example. Uh, but commercials where the problems are, they're chunky, they're idiosyncratic, and they're going to keep coming for years. And it's going to be like Texas in the seventies. Some of us can remember that. So interesting. And your thoughts, Peter? Uh, so I'll throw in another stock. Uh, I, we don't own it, <laughs> but uh, it's been quite astonishing to watch similar chart pattern as NVIDIA, and that's uh, Super Microcomputer, which uh, today had a seven-day relative strength index of 99, and you can only go to 100. And I've never seen that before in my life. So when you see parabolic moves like this in big companies, uh, it just tells you how hypey we are in, in this phase. And you can have the greatest business model, but what this does is it steals a lot of future returns. And just yeah. as running a marathon, a person who has a measured pace will get to the end of the race. Those that start out with a sprint will always die out. And when you see a parabolic move, it's the equivalent of a sprint. Oh. With respect to the economy, uh, the US economy has a lot of confusing cross currents. Uh, you look at the housing market, which has the pace of transactions for existing homes near a 30 year low, but home builders that are building more homes to fill the supply need. But even within the home builder sector, uh, only the bigger ones are doing okay. The smaller ones are squeezed by the higher cost of capital. Uh, you have a recession going on around the world in manufacturing, but there's some possible signs that maybe a restocking phase is ahead of us in the second half of this year. You have the consumer, high-end consumer spending money on traveling and going to Vegas and concerts and restaurants, but the lower-end consumer uh, can barely afford a bag of potato chips and a soda. Uh, when you hear consumer products companies selling stuff that costs less than a dollar, uh, talking about a choiceful consumer, uh, you know you have some serious issues in parts of the consumer-driven uh, economy, and that was highlighted by the retail sales number, which was weaker than expected for January. Then you can throw in uh, all the government spending that is lifting spend on manufacturing facilities, building up battery plants and chips, and of course, a lot of infrastructure projects 
highlighted by Martin Marietta Materials, which sells aggregates and cement that goes into those projects. Then globally, taking a step back, Japan, uh, unexpected decline in Q4 GDP, technically a recession. The UK, technically a recession. Germany, technically a recession. China, obviously having its own economic challenges, all at the same time that the cost of capital uh, is at the highest level in 15 plus years. And uh, I think it's going to take a lot for central banks to give up the inflation fight to have them cut rates and so-called save the day that so many equity guys are hoping for is the Fed is somehow will cushion uh, every bump in the road for us. Yeah, that's good points. And your thoughts are in any uh, shooting star examples? No, I'm or, just listening to them yeah. and they're all really great, great points. Um, you know, it's, and, and as we look towards those, I can only, yesterday the 13F came out, you know, for some of the big investors and I was, I, I, I mean, they don't usually sway me at all. I like to see what they're doing uh, from a trade because I'm a trader uh, first and foremost. It was interesting to watch Druckenmiller that he was getting rid of some of the high flyers, Amazon, uh, Alphabet, and what he was acquiring in, in that last quarter was really caught my interest because, you know, I, I've I've watched, I have great respect for Stan Druckenmiller. He's one of the great global macro minds. And uh, the fact that he's now starting to acquire Newmont and Barrick was really interesting because from a divergence, I mean, we're, we're all sitting here and I think we all look at things that diverge and why are they diverging? And the miners have, have been, to say that they're terrible, is not doing justice to that word. They've been they've been absolutely insane. In fact, you know, Newmont is like a five percent dividend down at these levels, uh, and gold is not, not maybe you know like what five five percent off its all time highs. So, right. interestingly, that that Druckenmiller is looking at these. You know, what is he seeing here? Uh, it makes me pay attention because I, you know, we as you could hear from. Um, what Chris and Peter are saying, it's not that we're value investors, but we understand when things get so overextended that they're priced for nirvana. And, you know, I believe in nirvana like I believe in unicorns. It just doesn't exist. Uh, yeah, you can make it exist for X and Y, but we learned it. But I traded through the Hunt silver debacle. So I know that you can make things last until they can no longer last to, uh, 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 Herb Stein, you know, that which can't, and it can't go. So that will get to that point. So now I'm searching for other things that I think have value going forward, especially, and I know we'll get into it with Chris's last piece on the reconstruction finance uh, program and, and what will it mean for different asset classes going forward. So I, well, you know, to Peter's earlier point, Ira, uh, think about the fact that I heard about Thermo Electron yesterday. This is a company I used to cover in semiconductor cap equipment. Now, when you hear about this stock, that is really unbelievable. <laughs> this is normally a stock you don't hear about. It's a commodity provider. But it has moved a lot recently because of what's going on in semiconductors, ARM, all of the above, right? Uh, right. Nobody knows what's happening. And to your point and also Peter's point, I think the big crowd that was kind of in a consensus as to the narrative over the last five, six years, is separating now. You have some people who want out and in a big way, and you have other people that are doubling down. Look at, you know, to your earlier question, right, commercial real estate. Why does Chris suggest that we need long-term financing for this stuff? Because, as you know, it's underutilized, and it's not likely to become utilized. So that means that the value is going down. We have higher expectations, higher cap rates from investors. So the value is going down. Um, I think there are a lot of negatives on this. I'm, I'm just going through Caro's great uh, biography of Robert Moses, which I urge you all to listen to or read. It's on Spotify. Uh, unbelievable what that man achieved. He was the progressive of his age in terms of what he achieved, right? But we need that scale of redevelopment now. That's, that's a striking thing, and the cost is exponential. We can't convert these buildings to resi, number one. And you can't tax the residential residents, right, enough to pay for the building. Building's too expensive. 
So what we're really saying is that the value of all of those assets in urban legacy cities and even southern cities, by the way, it's going to go down. You know, Dallas, Cincinnati, you don't think of these cities when we talk about this stuff, but they have the same problem. Downtown Dallas is empty. They're all out in South Lake by the airport, <laughs> which is, by the way, extremely overbuilt. We have an overbuilding po- you know, problem because all the money from New York went to Texas and built stuff. And same with Florida. So, well, you know, we're going to have a workout opportunity for a lot of financial professionals for years to come in, in commercial real estate. I, yeah, you know, and when I read your piece, I thought back to 1989, 1990, 91, when I had the three volume of the Resolution the Resolution Trust Corporation. I yes. had that on my desk. And then I got the second one that was more up to date. And I did more time advising people who did, they bought yeah. banks. They bought banks down in Austin. I tried to buy some property in Dallas, but they were so good that they were not getting out of tech. Well, you may need something like that for the banks, Ira. Yeah. Just, no, I, just I, for I, the depositories, right? Work out, you know, whatever. Give, you know, take preferred stock because otherwise you're going to merge them together. We're doing that in mortgage, by the way. We're going to get rid of about two thirds of all issuers in the United States by the end of this year, uh, starting you know back in 22. It's quite amazing. Uh, so consolidation is the watchword in all of these industries right now. I keep saying we should put Goldman and City together, but people think I'm crazy. But I, I think that the commercial real estate problem is it doesn't matter what asset. Now, office obviously has its its problems uh, as an asset in itself. But regardless of what piece of real estate you own, if you have debt coming due this year that was priced before 2022 yeah. and you have a loan to value ratio that's too high, you're in trouble. Well, they're going to ask you for money, Peter. That's this conversation that's going on everywhere. Exactly. LTV. So, right. So you can have a 98% occupied multifamily in the greatest location yeah. in South Florida or Dallas. But if your three percent loan is about to reprice to eight or nine, yeah. you're you're dead meat. Well, the calculus is vicious on cap rates. Once that changes, the value of the building goes down, even if the net operating income is stable. Right. So the value comes down, yeah. and you need to pump up even more equity. Your equity is likely going to get wiped out, and yeah. uh, you, you'll deal with the bank on who's actually going to manage it. There. You know what I think is going to happen, guys, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. I think they're going to do massive forbearance uh for a lot of these banks in other words they'll roll the property if it's cash flowing if it's occupied but they know that the value has been severely diminished so they're just going to ignore the value so so what what i'm New saying York city to what, <laughs> yeah so what i'm saying what banks are going to do uh like one particular uh deal that i'm actually in uh just as an investor is the bank is going to give the uh the borrower an extra year or two Right. But they're going to basically going to lock in a loss for those two years on the hopes that after that one or two year forbearance, rates drop notably and the project can be refinanced. Or so uh, yeah, one you deal I saw. Forbearance, yeah. But you're going to burn cash during that time frame. And all you're doing is having your fingers crossed that after that time frame is over, that somehow rates are going to collapse. So if rates just stay where they are, the forbearance is, is, is not going to buy you a lifeline other than just a year or two. Yeah, in some cases, I've seen them offering to hold the coupon, but they want cash. In other words, they want a margin call on the value of the property. And again, that's tough because a lot of these landlords, remember, got kicked around during COVID. Nobody talked about landlords in Washington or Albany, obviously, when they put the lockdowns in place. So these firms are badly hurt already. And now they're going to go through a, a restructuring of their major equity assets. <laughs> I, <laughs> I don't know if RFC is enough, Ira. <laughs> and, and, and so many real estate borrowers borrowed interest only. Of Both course. Three, they all did that. Years. So no principal has been paid down when you had these robust rental increases. Um, oh makes it well, look at work. the fact that Durst is selling that landmark property they have in Long Island City. That's a brand new, fully occupied multifamily building. They're selling it. They're getting out. That tells you something. 
and, and fresh capital is going to have licking their lips for bargains. Well, some people are going to rush in here and buy, but I think those people are foolish. I really do. Uh, there was a huge surge in commercial right after the lockdown ended, remember? Uh, and then they all thought about it a little while. And I also think global, you know, commercial big stuff that, you know, the big funds and insurers and everybody else chases has got a lot of aspiration in it. A lot of fluff. In, in parallel to the to, to the restructuring, do you see uh, uh, repurposing in different industry sectors or, or business models? Well, you know, it's funny. A, land, a landlord, a dear friend of mine, Dale Hammerdinger, who passed away uh, last year, uh, was head of the MTA, you know, big commercial landlord in New York City. I lived in one of his buildings. And he said, you know, if you're talking about a building before the age of air conditioning, you actually have a better chance of doing a conversion. But the more modern buildings are optimized for commercial. So in order to make that conversion, you've got to gut it and do new risers and everything for the services and the whole bit. It's very expensive. Most and, buildings, it's not worth keeping the outer shell in the frame, right? Mm -hmm. You might as well just knock it down. And the environmentalists are going to go crazy because they all want us to just use the office buildings. But i got to tell you guys, a city like that is going to become ugly real fast. It, it's going to be bizarre. <laughs> uh, be, I've read that, be... <laughs> that, that only about 15 to 20 percent of buildings can be repurposed. Yeah. Uh, it, Look it, at the flat iron. That's cool. That's a small building, though. you know. I actually, I, Chris, I want to get your thought. Like, we have clients in, uh, we, we've trimmed it because I, I don't like it, but um, it, B read, for example. Okay, so let's, let's broaden this out to the institutional world and the geniuses at Blackstone. Uh, B read has a net asset value that has not gone down. Right. It actually went down, I think, less than 1% in 2023. Um, <laughs> when you think about all the money, the advisor money that's piled into commercial real estate via these private uh, real estate funds, uh, when they start acknowledging reality that the values of the properties are marked down, uh, that's when you really get a flight of money out of commercial real estate. And I'm wondering whether you even have taken a look at BREIT and have any thoughts. Well, I have. Actually, them being we, the monster. Yeah, we compared them as a mortgage REIT to the downtown LA uh, equity REIT that Brookfield has. And obviously, downtown East LA is not very pretty at the moment in terms of asset values. Uh, neither are a lot of the other northern cities, right? Um, but I do think the equity uh, tells you what's going to happen in the mortgage. In other words, the Blackstone unit is now basically an equity read because the equity is gone. So they're next. And the only thing that really matters is what's the value of the underlying assets. Their assumption is that they're okay because there's 50 cents of equity in front of them. But in some cases, that may be wrong. You know, the equity is gone. So, you know, that to me is the calculus and, you know, everybody's fighting about it in the market every day. It's a very heavily traded stock. A lot of people are short that stock and I think the shorts are probably right. Well, I also mean the, the, the B read, the private read. Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. yeah. Same thing. Not public trade. Thing. I agree. I, I think they have major marks ahead that they're not acknowledging. I, look, everybody in the risk community that I talk to basically says that the haircuts you see on the equity side will start to be, you know, evident on the mortgage side too, in some of these cases. Because some of these buildings are going to walk away. You know, when your manager walks away from their equity and hands you the keys, you own it at 50 cents on the dollar, but odds are you can't sell it for that. So that's where a lot of banks are. The banks will be sellers. They will just sell and get out. The uh, regulators have told them to get out. So the question is, who buys it? Are these hard money investors who are going to jump in here? I don't think a lot of the old old pros who've already left the Northeast, for example, to go down to Texas are going to be interested. But who knows? You know, remember some of the guys who bought the FDIC assets? They immediately flipped them, which I thought was kind of, you know, sad. FDIC usually wants you to hang on to stuff for a while. So, yeah. Uh Interesting. Yeah, uh, just uh, Chris, uh, on another topic for uh, overnight reverse uh, repurchase market, uh, any thoughts there? The the level shows it to be down to 575 
billion are, are there any issues of concern or what or challenges what, what are the implications of this if if any in your view well the fed had to open up that repurchase facility the reverse facility to basically manufacture t bills so they came out and they provided enough yield to the money market funds gse some foreign banks that they could survive that was the initial need right but unfortunately, the Fed is now stuck in a situation where that reverse book is kind of a, a, a liquidity offset for the ebb and flow of the Treasury General account, which is kept at the Fed. The Treasury doesn't keep their money in banks. They give it all to the Fed, which I think is a mistake. Uh, and then everything else that's going on. So the Fed has to try and figure out how much they can let that reverse book go down or even to zero. Uh and then have to manage the market as a result. So, for example, when tax payments go out, the liquidity disappears. You have days when there's literally no net liquidity in the market. They don't know how to measure that still. That's the thing that the PhD economists haven't figured out yet. So, the big, re you know, the reason they went big in 2019 with the Fed balance sheet was to say, well, we don't want to worry about this anymore. But they still have to worry about it because the banks have an infinite hunger an appetite for risk-free assets, right? So the more they provide, the more the market wants. So I, I think it's a bit of a, a conundrum for the Fed. They are being punished for doing too much. And I think they have done too much. And they don't know how far down they can push reserves or how far down they can allow versus to go. You know, because classically, if we had Beko here, right, he'd tell you to drop the rate to a penalty rate and force everybody out. Okay, the old school within the Fed, the few people that are left, right, they say the same thing. But the guys at the Board of Governors, you know, these are all politicians. So they're chasing their tails and they, they don't know. They model this versus GDP, liquidity. And there is no link between the two that I'm aware of. So, you know, I'd love to hear what Ira thinks about that. Well, you know, Chris, I, I, so we're going down this road. So I had, so in discussing the piece that you put out, a very good friend of mine, and not the Speaker of the House, but uh, I was in graduate school with him. We still talk regularly. So he 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 loved the piece, but he said, ask Chris, and his name is Kevin McCarthy, like the Speaker of the House, but, but also from uh, New Rochelle, that's where he grew up. But he has said, where is the money going to come from uh, with with all this global debt? Where is it going to come from? Who's who is going to ultimately bail all of this out? Because everything we talk about is on a global basis. It's we're not just talking the U.S. And as Peter has over so many times talked about the effects, and we're seeing it in China. And China is just one little part of it. Really, one little part of it. There are so many right. others who, who, who of course went to the trough and drank from negative interest rates. And you see what's going on in Germany. Germany has Germany has so many different problems, but they also have a real estate problem, which Germany is not prone to have. They're so conservative, but mm. now they're in this too. So where is the money going to come from on that basis? Oh, I think you could finance this easily in the bond market, just the way the RFC did. There is an endless desire for risk-free assets out there. And as you've just described so beautifully, the rest of the world is a mess. So if we got our act together, started to address the budget deficit, or at least froze spending, right? That's what I would do. Uh, a vehicle like this, where you're essentially a senior secured creditor to the asset, which is how Treasury operates, as you know, when they extend credit, they would have warrants. Uh, and you would only use it for situations that were really gnarly and really big. I think the industry would finance the rest of it. But they need some encouragement because if you tell them that prices are going to fall for the next 20 years after rising for the last 75 years, that's going to be a tough sell. Art. <laughs> we have to sell the mess, right? How are we going to sell the mess? <laughs> mm. That's the only way the deal works, right? That's the rule of finance. So that's the problem is right now, if you had a busted bank, you had to go out and sell today. People are going to say, well, what the hell is going to happen to prices? That's the calculus, right? And that's why they had to sweeten that deal for Jamie Dimon, even though that was his customer, First Republic Bank, right? He held all their collateral already, but he still needed concessionary financing 
to take that book of very strange looking private, you know, interest only mortgages. It's uh, it's quite a bunch of cats and dogs, by the way. California loans, as I would call them. And uh, speaking of banks, uh, what are your thoughts, Chris, on like banks in Japan as an asset class? Ira's been bullish on this, uh, hmm. you know, category. Any thoughts there or insights? Well, the Japanese have had a reasonably good year. They were hmm. talking about getting off the zero bound and doing some other things. The only Japanese exposure I have right now is Toyota. Uh, because every time the little green babies start yowling at Toyota for not going electric, I say, Dr. Toyota is right. Shut up. You know, those, that okay. man knows more about material science and electricity than a dozen of the top, you know, ecologists. My God, it's embarrassing, really. You know, he, he's right. Hybrids is the way to go. Sorry. The periodic table has not changed in the last hundred years. Thank you very much. <laughs> you know, it's amazing. But, uh, you know, global banks, I hope the Japanese banks can figure out a way to grow. The one I follow is Nomura. You know, it's not much going on there. Um, it's bitchy, just sold out uh, Union Bank of California to U.S. Bancorp, uh, continuing the hit parade for foreign banks in the United States. I can't think of one that has done well in this country with an acquisition. So. But if I could pick Yeah. Peter, well, you, you're very active, so why don't you go and speak to that, and then I'll... Uh, well, Japan, yeah, we've been long Japan for the last couple of years, and the Japanese banks, uh, you know, the, the I think what we're seeing is uh, the revelation that when you flatten the yield curve as a pan, like a pancake, you destroy the profitability of your banking sector, and therefore you inhibit transmission mechanism and economic growth and so on and so on. Uh, banks live by the lifeline of a steeper yield curve, and uh, the Japanese bank increases uh, just a hint of uh, a slightly steeper yield curve uh, ignited a rise in prices. And the Japanese topics bank stock index in nominal terms since 1989 is down about 85%, <laughs> as the Nikkei is about to finally get back to where it was in 1989. The BOJ has destroyed the Japanese banking system with a lot of regional banks that were on life support now actually have a little bit of a heartbeat. And over the past 20, 30 years, a lot of the bigger Japanese banks, because of the yield curve in, in Japan, have have diversified their loan books. That half their loan books are outside of Japan. Now, of course, mm. uh, you get like Azura, who, who got a little over their skis in U.S. real estate, but... The growth of, of the Asian economy, broadly speaking, which makes up about half the world's population, uh, will benefit the larger Japanese banks that, like I said, have diversified their loan books uh, over the decades away from, from Japan. Uh, but I like to look at, in terms of the, the market messaging of where Japanese yields potentially could go, is the 40-year yield, because that's the furthest out on the yield curve. Therefore, it's the least manipulated by the BOJ, and that yield uh, is back above 2%, which I think is pretty uh, interesting about where maybe market interest rates in Japan could go if left to its own devices. And I do think uh, the Japanese, whether it's March or April, uh, and it's only 10 basis points, but negative interest rates is about to die uh, in the next couple of months, which doesn't say a lot because it's only 10 basis points, but symbolically, it says a lot that we've exited that era. Uh, I do want to swing back for a second with your discussion of reverse repo, because I think it's a big part of this conversation, is you, it could be a big driver of when the Fed ends QT. Oh, yeah. And when Definitely. that facility goes back to near zero, what does that mean for QT? I think Jay Powell does not like this very large balance sheet, but then you have Lori Logan saying, okay, well, the end of the reverse repo uh, in terms of its size, means we got to end QT quickly, and we'll still have this big balance sheet. Uh, so I think that that's a, a now the Fed has talked about the March meeting will be uh, that will be a big topic of discussion. We'll see what the results of that conversation is. But uh, this is all the Fed still winging it, just as they they were winging it when they were doing this extraordinary policy on the easing side. They're now winging it on how to ex you know get out of it. But now they're going to be stuck with a large balance sheet. Uh, 
because the market's not going to like when the reverse repo facility gets close to zero. It, it, it's like the Aquaman movie, right? You can't go back. Um, and the rule of history <laughs> says that Ed Kane taught me years ago. Uh, in this case, particularly, it's, you know, you know, people's behavior changes and their desire for more risk-free reserves increases, obviously, when you offer them. So you can't take it back. That's the problem. You you would literally seize up the system because, you know, if J.P. Morgan and, and Wells fold their arms and say, nah, we don't need any more exposure right now, then the market's going to have no liquidity. You know, the smaller dealers that I work with, forget about it. Uh, but that's what they're afraid of. They don't want another December 2018, which is what drove them to go big in 19. And they still had two hiccups in 19, remember. But... It, well, people, you know, we all know this, but they cut the duration of every mortgage-backed security in the country in half in 2019 before COVID. So these people are crazy. I mean, the fact that they would even do that tells you that they were scared. I think Powell was totally intimidated by what happened at the end of 2018, and they reacted as bureaucrats react. They were trying to make the problem go in a way, Peter. They made it worse. Well, the funny thing is when Powell was asked about uh, not the last press conference, but prior ones, is what is the right level of bank reserves that you'd be comfortable comfortable with with respect to your balance sheet? And he said, yeah, we'll know when we see it. Uh, well, that's because they model it off GDP. You know, that's Lori Logan, by the way. I I wouldn't take advice from her on the time of day. I, uh, mm. you know, they, this whole construct, unfortunately, comes back you know, from a lack of leadership at the Fed. After 2008, the entire institution melted down and a number of very key people left. If you look at who left the Fed in New York after that uh, period, it kind of tells you in a, in a sense what was going on. Uh, then the reorganization under Dudley, which was a disaster, by the way, they got rid of the foreign department. So their, you know, discussions with foreign central bankers was badly hurt. Uh, it's just been one thing after another. And it's all run by the board, remember. Uh, New York Fed was totally emasculated after 2008. So they just take orders now. Uh, Ira, go, yeah, yeah, go ahead. So, for, yeah. yeah, this is good. Well, let me just return to Japan for a minute and what Peter had to say. Hmm. And I want Chris's opinion on this. When you look at, like, the one bank that in, in Japan that I've loved is Tokyo Mitsubishi. And I've been in there for far too long, but it's like owning a bond. You know, I've owned it for, since three or four dollars, and it paid a nice four or five percent dividend, and it's done nothing. It's I'm an absolute idiot for you to, but it's like owning a bond, and now it's starting to move a little bit. But when I look at Tokyo Mitsubishi, and I compare and contrast them to UBS, now I got bullish on UBS because I thought UBS was doing something smart in Asia, which was finally cutting themselves off from the Goldman Sachs model of being a hedge fund to going yes. back to wealth management. And UBS did it really well, far better, of course, than we saw at Credit Suisse, and they've borne the fruit of it. I mean, now they've got they've got to work their way through the the uh, the forced merger with Credit Suisse, but, but they've been so strong in wealth management. And I look at Tokyo Mitsubishi, and because of what happened in 08, they own 23% of Morgan Stanley. And oh. Morgan Stanley has returned to wealth management too under Jamie Gorman. Yeah, I think he was forced into it because they were never going to be in that risk-taking. They didn't want to be. They, they were always had, you know, John Mack, going back to John. They've had issues about where, how they're going to go here and how they're going to do this. So if, they, if those boards ever got themselves together, they could use, I think, the the wisdom of Morgan Stanley's uh, wealth management and really, you know, compete uh, effectively with UBS in Asia using the premature uh, of um, of Tokyo Mitsubishi. But that's just, you know, for the long run. And they're in Tokyo Mitsubishi. I mean, if you want to talk a bank that's basically bulletproof you know, for Japan, it would be Tokyo Mitsubishi at this point in juncture. Mm. But I'll. But to pick up on the other things, especially with the New York Fed, and when I read Chris's piece, and I keep coming back to it because it was so good, but it made me stop and look at our star. 
And everybody, now the academics like to talk about our star and there's people sitting at the Fed who want to talk about our star and Powell's trying to get away from it. But when I read Chris's piece, the first thing that came to me, and then on a second read, the second thing that came to me <coughs> was what is our star in a highly leveraged economy? And nobody talks to that. And this is what always seems to get them in trouble. You know, it's one thing to have a 2% real yield on overnight money uh, or, or even 10 year, you know, cause if you look at 10 year US uh, notes, there, it, for 40 years, the effective real yield was basically 2%. But in a highly leveraged economy that we've evolved, especially since 2008, and it was given rocket fuel in, in 2020, 2021, what should our star, should our star always be to in order to, to keep, uh, as, as Chris talked about, before you even get there, should we be at negative real yields or at least zero real yields? You certainly, right now, I would say we're, well, if we use, the data out this week. So let's use CPI at three. So we're at, we're at over 2% on overnight money. Uh, now we can discuss whether that's the best vehicle, but where should our star be? And I, and I leave that because Chris's response was he's waiting for the fed to cut. And based on that, if they really understood the impact of our star and a real effective yield of that high in a highly leveraged economy, they would be a lot more nervous about where they're at than their, than they openly profess to be. Can I, can I chime in on this R star thing? Yeah, go, go ahead, Peter. Uh, R, R star is 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 econometric academia PhD mumbo jumbo. Um, <laughs> speaking, Powell doesn't Powell doesn't know where the right level of reserve should be. He's also said I have no idea what R star uh, should be. And um, you know, historically before. 2008 and and going back 20 30 years the the, the fed funds rate was typically 3 to 400 basis points above the rate of inflation and then somehow they created this r star of 50 basis points that if inflation's 2 the ideal fed funds 2 and a half and now they think well maybe the that that neutral rate should be 200 or 250 i mean they're throwing darts at a wall here um which is which is scary but that's what they do Hmm. Yeah, well, there's so little consensus on how we measure inflation. It's kind of a useless argument. Remember, Neil Kashkari actually mentioned it in one of his comments about a week ago. And it's like, all right, Neil, tell us what it is. And he can't. And they can't document it either. I don't think they should use our star for policy if they can't explain to people what it is. That's really so the This is also the same committee that, that wanted to do inflation symmetry. Yes. But you I mean, know, was, if, if we have to, it, but when they restart uh, quantitative easing, if the deficit continues to grow, then the Fed will have to buy more bonds. And that basically tells you how big the balance sheet has to be. It has nothing to do with monetary policy. It just has to do with the size of the debt and the funding that Treasury has to do. That's going to dictate the size of your balance sheet, right? It's Latin American. We're not used to this in this country, but we've got to start speaking Spanish, maybe Portuguese, and put okay. ourselves in more of a, a Argentine mindset, and then this will all start to make sense. And and, and I agree, and I, and I think that 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 is one of the things that the Fed is going to have to face the next round of QE to absorb that Treasury supply is yeah. next time they're going to tank the dollar, and we're going to see long term rates actually go up while they're doing QE. Yes. Well, that's normalization, off. though, Peter. Don't you think we need a, a normally sloped yield curve fund? <laughs> yeah. The, the, this next phase of easing, however, which way they want to do it, they're going to be unforeseen consequences. Like, I think long rates go up if they cut short rates. Yeah, but for lenders, if we could push Fed funds down into the fours, just leave it at four and a half. That's enough. That at least lets you finance more of the book at a, a positive yield because right now the average coupon on corporates and mortgages right it's still pretty low so if i'm paying so for plus one for a warehouse or for any kind of financing i'm getting killed 
but I think the long end, I agree with you, the long end goes up for a variety of reasons. Uh, and that will hurt housing because we price off the, I, I guess we price off the 15 year now. <laughs> Any uh, th- thoughts the average on that? life, I, yeah. I mean, even the current production stuff, you noticed in December, there wasn't that much of a bump in volume. Not that much. Uh, VA stuff, yes, by the way, that's going to become a hot issue in Washington, prepayments on Veterans Administration refinance loans. So, well, uh, Ira, what, what do you see the uh, U.S. yield curve going out well, for I, the rest of the year? I, yeah. I mean, we're all in this camp, and and the fact that it stays inverted is well, using the two ten to five thirty uninverted uh, quite a bit of well, but for the institutional basis of the two ten, yeah, I, I mean, we're we're sitting here, and you saw the movement this week. Right off the CPI, right? They, the curve was down at uh, negative 25, and by the end of the day, was negative 34. So that was a pretty substantial move off of, and, and Peter can easily speak to that because that uh, owner's equivalency rent in there, which I wish he would speak to, was was a big driver of that. And yet, that's you know, if you want, if you think. Uh, uh, jobs and, and unemployment are a lagging indicator the owner equivalency rent in the way that the bls figures it which drove so much of that um yeah have you noticed that democrats are pushing subsidies for rent now oh I, I, this legislation I, in the house to uh to, and the senate i think to do that well I, i'm yeah, i'm glad you bring that up because i'm so excited for the uh humphrey hawkins testimony to the senate banking committee after those two letters that happened to come out on the on the Tuesday and Wednesday of the Fed meeting, for, you know, mm-hmm. the, um, the Elizabeth Warren four, and it was interesting that Sherrard Brown was not on that, and then the wow. next day he comes out with his own. So I thought that was interesting too. He didn't sign their little letter. He didn't sign, uh, right? I, I think because he understands that if you drop rates, home prices go up a lot. Yeah, but he but he came out with his you know pushing his own. So I'm waiting for this Humphrey. I mean, this should be quite a show it, it, based on, or, or, or they're just going to go because they got marching orders to go quiet because yeah. Yellen and Brainerd have their fingerprints over all over so much of this stuff. I mean, it's an election year and the White House is engaged. I know. Two, two, two fully qualified economists. You know, Brainerd is a terrifying uh example like Volcker and like Jerry Corrigan of a kind of mid-level economist that segue to a management role and it's like no but that's what we do we put people in in positions and they have no idea so I was going to mention two things first off notice that Janet sold the full allocation of tens this time they had pulled back at the end of last year because market said no I think you're going to see them trying to push the envelope on longer term issuance because they need to do it. Four, four may look really good in a couple of years, guys. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah, really. um, the other thing I would mention is I have a bio Stan Middleman coming out later this year. He's the founder of Freedom Mortgage. And in my discussions with Stan, you know, that's informed my view of what's going to happen. I think they drop rates. We have a little bump in resi for a couple of years. And then by 26, 27, we have a maxi reset in resi. And I think the catalyst will be commercial because the losses from commercial are going to just keep rolling out every quarter. They'll have no warning. The banks, you know, can time this stuff when they want, uh, but they will continue to, you know, spit up these big chunks of nastiness and it'll hurt earnings and it'll add volatility to earnings too. So it'll be very difficult to predict. Uh, but I really think the 70s oil patch restructuring rolling into the SNL crisis is an instructive example. We should think about that. And even on the corporate side, uh, you know, a lot of small businesses, medium sized businesses that were borrowing floating rate, you know, in a way that they've absorbed the, the rate shock already. But it's the investment grade side, it's the high yield side, it's mm. the leverage loan side. Their maturity wall, walls only get taller and taller over the next couple of years. Why do funds think they can do this, Peter? Come on. See, a bank can hide stuff like this for years. I have some great examples I'm accumulating, by the way. Uh, You know, and it's like if there's a bankruptcy, they don't have to disclose it. (laughs) 
Yeah. Uh, God, yeah, the opacity of corporate disclosure on financials is growing a lot. And when I see funds diving into credit, it just scares the hell out of me. Because ultimately, the banks fund them. And if the banks don't like it, they'll pull the funding, and that's the end of it. You know? Also, take look at the other side of that transaction. So when we get to hear from private credit, you know, we'll get you 13% returns, equity-like returns. Well, yeah. I feel bad for the business that's borrowing from you. How are they going to survive with your 13 to 14% interest rate that you're offering them? Oh, they won't. Exactly. Well, I'll give you another example. The if private gold, credit people, are, I think, are... But when Goldman and Rhythm and Morgan Stanley provide warehouse financing for lenders or financing for this kind of stuff from their fund clients, right? They have no comparative advantage. These guys pay full boat for funding. They're right up there with Capital One City. So, you know, if I'm Bank of America, at least I have a relatively cheap cost of funds, although I will say on this program that Brian is underwater. He is going to drown. So I'm going to put that market down with you guys. I mean, with bank, with the the right? Two and a half percent yield on the uh, securities book. And he's stuffing stuff into held to maturity as fast as he can. Bad. Yeah. Hmm. He's not going to make the cut in my new bank index. I'll tell you that. Not in the top 50. Uh -uh. But there's a lot of people along that stock believing that it's bulletproof. So I know. Well, it's my commercial bank. It's not like they're going to fail. Look, I own the city trucks. I have a, quite a pile of trucks. So I have a contest among some of our mutual friends to see how many city trucks you can buy. <laughs> the nine of three quarters. Uh, yeah. And, wow. you know, the funny story is those are grandfathered as tier one capital, which is why they don't pay them off. So funding the credit card book with that is fine, you know. And uh, just a final question for today, Chris, uh, given this environment and the challenges, what are your thoughts on investment asset classes or trades that make sense? So you mentioned the funds into credit or um, we were talking before about active investing versus passive investing. Any thoughts on generic asset classes? Well, I pick my own mistakes. So um, I have largely not been buying equity in the financials. I own you. U.S. Bank, I just picked up a little because it was cheap. They're a long-term play for me because they're going to absorb Union Bank of California. I own New York Community Bank because I know the Flagstar guys. I love Sandro uh, Dianello, and he's going to fix the bank in my view. Um, that's about it. The rest of my financials are preferred, and then I have you know a variety of uh, consumables and uh, staples to just you know keep the portfolio on track. I did get out of Nvidia. At mm -hmm. seven thirty or something ridiculous like that. Okay, <laughs> but you know, to me, be careful of the financials. We're going into a period of credit, uh, and the credit costs are going to be high. I don't see an end of the world scenario here, but it's going to be ugly for some of them. And uh, you know, when you have Yellen and uh, you know Powell both out there talking about commercial real estate and bank failures, you've got to pay attention to the messaging. Yeah. You know? Yeah, exactly. And your thoughts, Peter? So we, uh, I'm my my portfolio is really tilted right now to well, it's been, but a little bit more so to commodities, uh, energy stocks. I think oil prices are going to $100. Uh, I recently got back into the ag space via some of the fertilizer names like Mosaic and Nutrien. Uh, still very bullish and long precious metals. Ira talked about the miners uh, earlier. We're very long the miners. Uh, it's hard to find a more hated asset class. Actually, the other favorite hated asset class, which we are bullish on, is the Hang Seng. I think mm -hmm. the Hang Seng outperforms the S&P 500 this year. Not many people know that the Taiwanese TIEX overnight closed at an all-time record high. So for all the concerns about China invading Taiwan, uh, well, that's Taiwanese stock markets at a record high. Uh, and the Chinese economy is not dead. Chinese consumer is not dead. All I have to do is look at the Macau numbers and we're along some of the Macau casino stocks. Wow, that's interesting. Observation on Taiwan, yeah. And Ira, your thoughts? Well, I haven't, it doesn't surprise me, but uh, Peter and I agree on a lot of the uh, raw material stocks, uh, especially ag. 
they've been and they've taken their hits. They oh, if you go back two three years, that we've owned them and talked about them. They perform pretty well. Again, I love. Uh, and I don't tout these things. Go do your own work. Uh, just like I know these guys would advise you go, you know, these are things that I can see from a global macro perspective. Like I draw out um, Tokyo Mitsubishi in that way from a global macro perspective, not a bottom up. I'm not, a, I'm a terrible bottom up uh, picker. My wife is far better. And I look to other people, okay. uh, but uh, the, uh, I also, I also like, Believe it or not, and, and for me to like any European financial asset, you know, I like Commerce Bank because Commerce Bank, which has been the most hated bank in Europe, rightfully so, by the way, but with Jens Wiedmann as the chair, as the executive chair, I have, and I think that what's coming there, and they've started paying a dividend again, so they're paying out some money, but I think you're, if, if the EU, and I, and it's an if, if the EU sustains itself and can get through all these dangerous um, points, uh, intersected points that they're at, I think uh, you'll see a broker-dealer bond system in the in Europe, which we don't have now. And when the ECB wrote a paper, I think it was back in 17 or 18, talking about this, that they were going to push that you had to be domiciled in the EU because they didn't want it to be overwhelmed by Goldman and without being there. So uh -huh. that would put Commerce in an interesting position. And they remember what we did to them in the eighties. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> they, and they're, so they, uh, they have some, so I'm just, you know, it, it's, and now they pay a dividend and I'll, and, and, uh, and I have great respect for, for Viedman. And just like mm -hmm. at UBS, we have Axel Weber who, if Merkel wasn't such a uh, spineless person, uh, he would have been, the head of the uh, ECB through a more tumultuous period, but yeah. she caved to Sarkozy. But that's besides the point. But, and I want to tell people, read Chris Whalen's piece on the Reconstruction Finance Corp. Because in there, he there's so much contextually that brings us forward today, which is why he wrote it. But it, it did remind me that the repeal of Glass-Steagall, which created so much havoc, in the financial system. But what people forget is the same day that Glass-Steagall was passed in June of 1933, that afternoon, FDIC was passed. And so they, they didn't forgot- read either bill, by the way. Huh? They didn't read either bill, by the way. <laughs> but when they, when they repealed Glass-Steagall, they forgot to repeal FDIC insurance. <laughs> um, they wanted to. Well, yeah, that, that was not ever going to happen. But so they Once gave you them give the it. You can't take it away. It's like reserves. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So so they allowed the banks to play with they they allowed them to privatize their rewards by uh, and 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 publicize the risk. It's a beautiful. It was a beautiful model until it wasn't. But uh, I think this is a great conversation. Really appreciate it. Yeah, it's been a great, uh, insightful discussion on the market and the banking system issues and challenges. Th thank you so much, Chris, Peter, and Ira. Thank, thank you. you, guys. Have a great day. Yeah, you too. Take thank care. you. All right, thank Bye -bye. you, guys. The FRA Roundtable Insight Show is for informational and educational purposes only and should not be considered as a solicitation or offer to purchase or sell any securities. The investments, investment strategies, and investment philosophies discussed or presented on the show each involve their own unique risk factors which are not discussed on the show. Any discussions among the panel participants or responses to listener inquiries are based on the personal opinions of the panel participants and do not take into consideration the listener's suitability, objectives, or risk tolerance. Please be advised that you invest or speculate at your own risk.